first of all, as you know, uh, we have an exam on Thursday, and that exam is going to cover chapters 15, the autonomic nervous system, 17, the endocrine system, and 7, which I'll be covering with you today, uh, over skeletal physiology. Now, two of these chapters, I think you'll find, are largely, I won't say completely review, but you have a lot of information that you're carrying into this course from Biology 105. The autonomic nervous system, I'm really not expecting much more out of you than what you already were responsible for in 105. And that, uh, I see a lot of you have been viewing that video and have been doing that quiz and it looks to be going very well. The endocrine system, this is the new unknown territory for most of you. And this is the area that I would be spending the majority of my time on if I were in your seat, thinking about what do I know the least about, what do I need to spend the most time learning, and that would definitely be the endocrine system. And as I mentioned before, teaching the endocrine system is a tricky business. Um, we need to understand the basis of the system, and then we need to use this information as we come across these hormones system by system through the rest of the course. So I want you to have a basic fundamental understanding of the endocrine system and then know full well that as we get to each system from this point on, we will introduce and dive deeper into many of these hormones. And then today I'll be starting a little bit of one of those hormone stories as we discuss the skeletal system and look at bone development. Now I want to go back and review just a couple of key ideas moving into this conversation on the endocrine system. Recall that I, I spent I told you at the beginning of this presentation, the first 72 or three slides were yours to review, and that your, first, your major job in that review was to use the guided reading assignment, if you chose, or to make flashcards, or whatever system works for you, and to identify the gland or the organ that produces the hormone, know the hormone, and have a basic understanding of what system and what that hormone's mechanism is in the body. That's where you need to be now, and then we'll build on that as we go through. So I'm at slide 74. This is the endocrine system, and just as a, as a ramp into this, remember that hormones come in three basic chemical structures. Number one, steroids. We've all heard of steroids. You may have heard that there are some negative effects of steroids, and we'll see those before we're done this today. But remind me, what is it about steroids? Give me a couple, two or three facts about steroidal hormones. They're hydrophobic, very good. And let's go right down, let's go down that trail right now. If they're hydrophobic, meaning that they are lipid, right, nonpolar, what does that tell us about how they travel through the blood? They need a transporter. They're not able to interact directly into the watery environment of the blood, so they need a transporter. So we're thinking that for a moment. Uh, give me some examples of some steroid hormones. They all end, or many of them end in sterone, right? So aldosterone, testosterone, uh, the estrogens, you'll see this, this own term in them oftentimes. So if it ends in O-N-E, it's a really good clue that it is a steroidal hormone. And remember, they're all derived from or made from cholesterol. So cholesterol is the, is the molecule that is common to all of these. Then some hormones are not lipid or uh, nonpolar. They are instead peptides or glycopeptides. Tell me about those. They are um, free from chains of amino acids. Right. They are, they're, they're proteins, right? So they're made up of our amino acid chains. We know a little bit about amino acids. And most of these are not going to be hydrophobic. Instead, they are going to be hydrophilic, which means that they can travel straight through the blood uh, without a carrier molecule. And now let's think about hormones. What do they do? They're released from one place, and they travel through the blood to a far, far away place, and they interact with cells that have receptors. Let's compare these two for a moment. Tell me about the receptor for hormones that are steroidal. Steroid hormones, remember they're hydrophobic, they need a transporter, but they're able to do what? Penetrate straight through the cell membrane 
and most oftentimes go all the way through the nuclear envelope and into the nucleus. So their, quote, receptor is not going to be membrane bound, but instead will be directly in the nucleus most often versus a peptide hormone. They can travel through the blood no problem, but their special thing is what? They need a receptor on the membrane surface, and then that hormone binds and something magical happens inside the cell. And I told you we're not going to deal with all of the mechanisms about what happens, but just know that when that hormone binds to the cell, that it will cause some sort of metabolic change. It'll cause something to change inside the cell. So those are the two big classes. There's a third class of hormones, and what were those? <coughs> Slipping over. Well, let's go back. What are some examples of, what are some examples of uh, peptide hormones? They're listed here. Oxytocin ends in IN. Not always, but oftentimes the hormones that end in IN are protein hormones. All of the hormones released from the anterior pituitary also fall in this class. So rattle off some of those hormones you know to be made in the anterior pituitary. You're all thinking FSH, LH, luteinizing hormone, um, ACTH, thyroid stimulating hormone, prolactin, right, that list. Those are all proteins that are, that are peptide proteins. Also, ADH. So ADH, oxytocin, and your anterior pituitary. Those are all going to be peptide hormones. It is. So ADH and oxytocin good are made by the hypothalamus and are released from the posterior pituitary. Correct. And the six hormones from the anterior pituitary. They are all peptide hormones. Proteins travel through the blood, no transporters necessary. The third type of hormone are smaller molecules. They're called the monoamine or the biogenic amines, and they are typically one or maybe two amino acids. Very, very small. And this is going to include uh, epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, melatonin. These molecules are going to belong to this class. The one you need to keep in mind here is also uh, thyroid hormone. Okay, it's a very, very small molecule. And these, for the most part, can travel through the blood without a problem. What was the exception here? Which one of these hormones on this list is hydrophobic and must have a carrier? Okay. Thyroid hormone. So thyroid hormone is a unique little creature. It is uh, nonpolar in its chemical arrangement, so it needs a carrier. Good. So we talked about the different uh, types of hormones last time, and I'm going back through some of those examples that I shared with you. We've already mentioned the idea of a carrier through the blood. Now, all hormones, right, they're traveling systemically. They're traveling through the entire body's bloodstream, but they're only going to be activating certain cells. And the cells that they activate must contain a what? Receptor, right? There must be a receptor. Now, we've talked about receptors can be different places. If it's a peptide hormone, then that receptor would be found on the membrane surface because those molecules can't get into the cell without being welcomed in by the receptor. If it's a steroidal hormone, then there won't be a receptor on the outside, but there would be a receptor on the inside and that would cause some metabolic change to occur. Another thing to think about is that for protein receptors, they can become saturable. Now, that's a, that's a way of saying that there's only so many receptors that can be on the surface of a cell. And if you have a huge surge of hormone, it really doesn't matter how much hormone you have because there's only so many receptors available. So you could have an overkill of hormone and not see a difference because you only have a limited number of receptors. So this idea of saturability of hormone receptors is important, and we'll discuss that in a moment. We'll also discuss how is it that cells can increase or decrease the number of receptors that they have. So cells can sort of uh, modulate 
how many receptors they have and therefore be more or less responsive to hormones. So this would be a hydrophobic hormone. Take a look at this picture. What do we see? In the picture on the, on the left, the, free, the, the little blue diamond is a bound hormone. Well, if it's a bound hormone, it must be what chemically? It must be a hydrophobic, hydrophobic or a nonpolar sort <laughs> of molecule. And we see that this molecule is being carried. So the green molecule is the carrier. The little blue molecule is the hormone. It can't travel unassisted, so it's traveling through the blood on the back of the carrier. If it's bound, though, to the carrier, it can't bind to the receptor. This is sort of the, the choice, if you will, that the hormone has to make. So when it gets to the cell, it has to unbind. It has to release itself from the carrier in order to be bound to the receptor. So we see that a small percentage of the hormone is free and able to bind to the receptor. Now, we just said, this is a great slide, is a good overview. We just said that if it's a nonpolar, steroid-like hormone that it can go straight through the membrane. Notice there's no receptor there on the surface. And instead, it is being received right into the nucleus as its receptor, and it will there directly affect transcription, and it will cause gene expression to go up or down, whatever that hormone's effects are. The other hormone on this picture is already a free molecule. And if you look around, you'll see that all of these yellow squares are themselves free. You don't see them bound to anything. So those hormones are able to travel through the blood unassisted. They would be what? Protein or peptide hormones or uh, hydrophilic molecules. And they can only interact with the cell by working through a receptor at the surface of the cell. Okay, so that's a good review of this is a really important little conversation. Is this making sense to you? Now what you need to do is make sure you have examples of these hormones. So when you think about hydrophobic and hydrophilic or protein or monoamine type of hormones, have that little short list of hormones in your pocket so that you can, you know, if I were to ask you, does thyroid hormone re require a cell surface receptor, you're going to think back, oh, no, thyroid hormone was that exception that was hydrophobic. So it does not need a cell membrane receptor. It goes directly into the membrane. So we be categorizing these hormones in that sort of way. So again, you see here this thyroid hormone. Again, it's one of those exceptions. Thyroid hormone, even though it is a protein, it is non, it is, it is nonpolar or hydrophobic. So it does requ require a carrier, and its receptor is directly in the nucleus and directly affects the transcription of the cell. I told you I'm not going to distinguish between T3 and T4, so don't just know that these are thyroid hormones, different forms. But for the purposes of this course, we're not going to differentiate those two. Recall these videos are great little videos to watch if you are confused about this. And most of those, recept most of those um, videos are going to be part of your Connect assignments anyway. And you'll be watching them and answering questions about them. I told you there's sort of this big, mysterious black box. When a hormone binds to a receptor, there are lots of things that can happen. And this is called a second messenger system. So the first messenger was what? The hormone, right? That was the first message, if you will. So the hormone comes in through the blood, binds to the cell, binds to the receptor, and then sets up a second messenger system. So the hormone itself does not come into the cell. Right? It stays out on the receptor. And when it binds to the receptor, it signals other things to happen inside the cell. Thus, this idea of a second messenger system. Now, there's a whole group of these kinds of molecules, and we're not going to spend time breaking that down. There's a time for that in the future. A lot of medications, right? A lot of pharma pharmacological medications are, are dealing with these second messenger groups, and you'll deal with that at another time. What I want you to see here is this, and I know this picture is a little bit small. This is from your textbook, figure 17, or chapter 17, figure 22. But there's the hormone, that little red guy. And it has bound to the receptor, which in this case is green. The hormone stays out there. The receptor has been activated. The hormone was the first message, right? That was the first signal coming in. 
Now it's going to activate a whole series of secondary steps inside the cell. And we see that, again, I'm not going to go into the details, but we see that other molecules are, there's all sorts of cascading events that happen inside the cell as a result. Ultimately, though, the hormone is going to cause the cell to have a change in its metabolism. It is going to cause gene expression to go up or down. It's going to regulate transcription in some way. So just know that your peptides and your catecholamines, remind me, catecholamine is a big word for some examples like what? Catecholamines include epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. So when you, hear, when you hear the word catecholamine, it's this whole group of molecules, right? Epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. And they are all what kind of molecule? The catecholamines were those monoamines. They were very small molecules, and they are also themselves hydrophilic, right? They are able to travel through the blood unassisted and require a membrane receptor. So this idea, one of, one of the foundational, fundamental ideas of the endocrine system is that a little bit goes a long way. It doesn't take a whole lot of hormone to have a very significant effect on the body. So hormones, by their very nature, are released in very, very small amounts, travel through the blood, specifically are bound by their receptors at their target cells. A little bit goes a long way. And the reason a little bit goes a long way is this idea of enzyme amplification. There can be a very, very small stimulus of just a little bit of hormone traveling, binding to a few receptors, but inside, so there's the hormone, the first step, but through these secondary steps, again, I'm not going into all the details of them, but these secondary steps are going to, quote, amplify that signal. So one friend tells two and two tell four, and it's very much a divergent kind of situation where a little bit causes lots of activity inside the cell such that a little bit creates a great effect. Okay, just a little bit of hormone in the right cell has a tremendous effect on the overall cell. We call this an, an, an enzyme amplification. The enzymes are inside the cell. Right? I'm not suggesting to you here that the hormone is the enzyme. The hormone caused this enzymatic cascade, these steps to occur within the cell. So how can cells deal with this? How, how does the body maintain its homeostasis and how can it adjust? How can a body become more sensitive or less sensitive to hormones? We're going to talk about type 2 diabetes here in a few minutes. And type 2 diabetes, it's a deal with insulin, but it's really all about the receptor for insulin. And the insulin receptor becomes less responsive to the insulin over time until such time there's very little control over blood sugar. So how does the body lose sensitivity or how can the body become more sensitive to, an enz or to a hormone? And it comes down to this modulation of sensitivity receptors, right? If you have 10 receptors on a cell versus a cell with 100 receptors, which cell is more responsive to a hormone? Likely the one with more receptors would be responsive to smaller amounts because there are more receptors, but there's a greater chance that the molecule will bind to the cell and cause this amplification effect. So it's possible to increase the number of receptors. That is called upregulation. So I'm going to upregulate the number of receptors. By doing so, the cell becomes more sensitive to the hormone that might be traveling through the blood. Or I could downregulate. I could reduce the number of receptors and therefore make the tissue less responsive. So it'll be less sensitive to the hormone. And this is exactly what happens when your body is exposed to hormones for a long time. Anyone ever put on steroids? Anybody put any kind of steroid regimen? And when you were put on the steroids, you usually took a little bit and increased the dosage. And then as you were finishing up that, that uh, medication, you kind of weaned yourself off. 
you never want to take a large amount of steroid and then wean yourself off immediately. I mean, you, you want to wean yourself off slowly because the body uses negative feedback. And if there's a large amount of hormone around, the body will absolutely downregulate. It's overwhelmed. Remember I told you hormones are always released in very, very small amounts. So there's a huge amount of hormone around. The cell says, whoa, this is overload. I can't handle this. And actually begins to downregulate and reduce the number of receptors available. Well, if you have tissues floating in hormone too long and they continue to downregulate, they no longer are going to be responsive at all. This is why endocrinology is such a difficult area. When one hormone is out of whack, it can cause many other hormones to also be out of kilter. And trying to correct all that is a very tricky business because the hormones themselves affect other tissues through this up and down regulation deal. So looking at this top picture, okay, this would be up regulation. And this is a cell. And it's showing you in this picture, the receptors are the little guys. The hormones or the molecules floating outside the cell. And if I increase the number of receptors on the surface, then I would actually become more sensitive, wouldn't I? I would increase the sensitivity to the hormone in the environment. Likewise, if I had a large number of receptors and I was being overwhelmed by it, just being overwhelmed by the amount of hormone, I could reduce the number of receptors and therefore become less sensitive to it and, quote, diminish the response or downregulate the response. So up and down regulation, the body does this on its own. Oftentimes, it becomes overwhelmed by the amount of hormone. We've talked about negative feedback. So what's the idea of negative feedback? Let's say you've got A goes to B goes to C. What is C going to do? If you have a lot of C, what's it going to do? Go back and tell B, and maybe go back and tell A, that, hey, I've, I've got plenty of product, I don't need to make any more, and part of that feedback includes this idea of sensitivity of receptors. So that's how the endocrine system deals with maintaining this homeostasis. Now, do hormones act in vacuums? In other words, when we learn about hormones, we learn about, oh, one hormone is released by this cell and goes to this tissue and causes this effect. Is that real life? No, in real life, we've got hundreds of hormones being released and they're traveling through the blood at all different times, and somehow these hormones are collectively maintaining our homeostasis. So that means that hormones, some hormones, right, are going to be synergistic in their effect. What's that word synergy mean to you? Working together so that maybe A, a hormone A and hormone B together are even better than they would have been by themselves. So they act together for a greater effect. An example of this, testosterone and FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, together work better at producing sperm than either one would by themselves, just as an example. Others are what we refer to as permissive. One hormone enhances another's later response, or one hormone allows or al permits another hormone to have an effect. So for example, estrogen prepares the uterus for action later on of progesterone. So one has to come along and allow the second hormone to have an effect. It's permissive. And then others are antagonistic. One opposes the other. Now that's probably where we know the most. If I were to ask you right now, give me two hormones that are antagonistic to one another. I think you would call out a couple of Primo examples. I'm hearing, am I hearing insulin and glucagon, right? Insulin and glucagon. Those are definitely antagonistic hormones because they're working, opposing each other when sugars are high or sugar is low. Okay. Okay. So hormones don't work in a vacuum. That's really what that's saying is that hormones interact with one another and the interactions can be very, very complex. I'm saying that, yeah, I said uh, hormones don't work in a vacuum, meaning that they don't work in isolation, right? There's, there's a lot more going on. So when you say that someone's in a vacuum, you know, there's only, they're only dealing with one thing at a time or very isolated, okay? So clearly our, our cells are not 
working in a vacuum. They're not isolated one from another. So you've got cells. They've released a hormone. It's traveling through the blood. How do we get rid of it? We've got to clear the hormone out of the body. If we don't clear the hormone, then it would just continue to have its effects, wouldn't it? How did we clear neurotransmitters? Let's go back. Let's compare now the nervous system with the endocrine system. How were neurotransmitters wiped clean? There was some reabsorption of acetylcholine, for example. Um, there was acetylcholine esterase that we'll talk more about in the muscle unit, but clearly hormones are wiped clean by some hormones. And neurotransmitters, some of them are just naturally, they break apart rather easily. Josh. Absolutely. Some of it's reabsorbed, some of it's absolutely broken down. Great. Whereas hormones, we have to break them down in some other mechanism. So once they're traveling through the blood, how are you going to clear it out of the body? Well, most hormones are going to be taken up by the liver, detoxified, broken down. And the kidney also will be filtering out the smaller molecules, and they'll end up in our bile or our urine. Why do you take some meds three times a day and others just once a day? You take the medications three times a day because clearly that medication must be cleared from your body more quickly, and it must be regenerated, right? You have to get more medication. So we would say that medications that you have to take three times a day have a shorter half-life. They are broken down rather quickly. They lose their metabolic activity. Drugs that you only have to take once a day would have a longer half-life, would maintain their levels at therapeutic levels in the body for a longer time. And we refer to this as the metabolic clearance rate, the MCR. Okay. So again, it's about uh, the half-life. Now, half-life is defined as how much time is required to get rid of 50% of the molecule. This is the term used in radioactivity. This is the term used in many other areas as well. But metabolic clearance rate, how quickly does your body get rid of it? Anybody go to the dentist and need more anesthetic than others? Like, you just know that... <laughs> you're just going to need more anesthetic. There are actually people with genetic changes or mutations in them, and they break down anesthetics more quickly. I'm one of those. They, they, they give me a couple shots of anesthetic, and they already know. they got to go to the booster, and they have to be giving me more because my body just breaks that stuff down really, really fast, and it's not effective very long. It's not that I'm a wimp, right? It's just that after about 10 minutes, it's like they didn't give me any medication at all because my body simply clears that particular medication more quickly. So my dentist knows to give me a different formula, a different drug that is cleared more slowly and it leaves me uh, pain-free a little bit longer. So maybe you've experienced something like that as well. Okay, so this is the metabolic clearance rate. Kind of changing gears a little bit, uh, talking about stress in adaptation. So before I go there, any questions on hormones, steroid versus peptide, their necessity for receptors, the idea of up or down regulation? Are we okay with the idea of a first messenger being the hormone and the second messenger being this big black box that happens inside the cell that facilitates metabolic changes? Anything at all? Or why were there anything at all about hormones? Is there any hormone you need to clarify? So peptides are mostly... Peptides are mostly... Say it again. Inhibitory. Not mostly inhibitory. No. Uh, peptides are most... Most peptide hormones are going to be hydrophilic and travel through the body with no problem. But there's, there's no... Um, I can't say that a hormone is more... Uh, inhibitory or excitatory based upon his class. Okay, so there's, there's, there are different effects. Different cells have different hormones, and some hormones can have a negative effect on some cells, and on other cells would have a positive effect. And those are some of the things, the specifics that we'll tease out as we go through system by system and hormone by hormone through the rest of the course. Any other thoughts right now? Anybody stressed? Right? A little bit of stress. That's good. A little bit of stress is good. Um, what is it that, 
how would you describe stress? One way, from a physiological way, would be to say that there's something kind of keeping you out of balance, right? Something homeostatically is not right. Or maybe you're being threatened either physically or emotionally. I certainly hope you feel physically safe here and that you feel emotionally safe here, but who knows what else is going on in your life, right? You could have some real stressors in your life. So let's talk about how the body adjusts to those stresses. And we'll use this term, the general adaptation syndrome. How does your body react to stress? Some of us do better than others, but regardless of how we react on the outside, there are still some physiological changes happening inside that we want to look at for a moment. And they typically deal with increased levels of epinephrine. We know epinephrine, right? Uh, the bear walks in the room, we get scared, we go into a sympathetic surge, and definitely epinephrine is a part of that fear factor, so we get that. There's also glucocorticoids, especially cortisol. Cortisol is, is one of those steroid hormones that we're learning a lot about that is definitely released during times of stress. And there are three stages in this syndrome, in this adjustment syndrome. Number one, we have the alarm reaction. Something triggers the response. Something triggers the emotional or the, the, uh, the, the epinephrine. Number two is how does the body resist that? So that's the stage of resistance. And then finally, hopefully none of us have experienced this truly stage of exhaustion, where the body has absolutely depleted all homeostatic mechanisms, and this can lead to death. So we're talking about the extreme end of this. So let's go through a couple of these steps. So the initial step, okay? The initial step is, um, did I skip over one? The alarm reaction. So the initial response. So this is, again, something has triggered some norepinephrine to be released. Remember I told you I'm not going to differentiate much yet in this course between epinephrine and norepinephrine. But epinephrine or norepinephrine is released. Um, and is part of your sympathetic nervous system. Epinephrine also from your adrenal medulla. Remember, that's where epinephrine is made, made in large amounts in the center of your adrenal glands. Now, we know what that hormone does. We know that it prepares that fight or flight response, and it will cause your body to consume glycogen. So remind me, what is glycogen? Glycogen is stored sugar, right? It's your body stores some extra sugar away, stores it in your liver, stores it in your muscles. It's there in that moment of need. So this epinephrine surge is going to cause your body to use that energy up. You're also going to increase your aldosterone and your angiotensin levels. We've mentioned both of those hormones in passing. Angiotensin is going to help raise your blood pressure. Look at that word for me for a moment. I, I know that we're memorizing these things. But look at that hormone, angiotensin. Break it down and tell me what it must do. It ends in IN, so it's a protein. It somehow affects this angio, our vessels, causing them to become more tense. Angiotensin. So if your vessels became more tense, your blood pressure would go up. Okay, so I know we're memorizing these terms, but let's break them down and make sense of them. And then there's also aldosterone. Aldosterone is made where? Where is aldosterone made? It's a steroid. It's a steroid. And it's an own. Good. It's a sterone, so it's a steroid hormone. Tell me where was it made? In the adrenal glands. Where in the adrenal glands? Cortex or medulla. All the hormones were made out in the cortex. And there were three layers. And there was a layer that made the mineral cork corticoids, the glucocorticoids, and this was the one from the mineral corticoids, right, the aldosterone. And it's going to promote sodium and water conservation. Okay, so what's that doing? If you're holding on to your salt, holding on to your water, it's also going to cause your blood pressure to go up. So what we have here are two hormones, both related to increasing our overall blood pressure. So that's the alarm stage, right? That's what got the whole thing started. How does our body respond to it? How does it respond? After a few hours, your glycogen's gone. You've used up all your extra sugar levels, but your brain still needs glucose. Remember, the brain only can feed on glucose. 
your brain can't use any other sugar. So if your brain isn't getting glucose and you've used up all of your glucose stores, then the body has to start making it. So we're going to start making glucose by using other forms of energy. Those other forms of energy are going to come from your proteins. Right? If you're in this stage for a long time, you're actually going to start breaking down your proteins to create energy for your muscles. Now, this stage of, of resistance is largely characterized by the hormone cortisol. Okay? Cortisol. And the hypothalamus releases a hormone called cortitropin-releasing hormone. Remember, anything with releasing in it is coming from the hypothalamus. And all those hypothalamic hormones go where? They just go down a few centimeters to the pituitary, and now the pituitary will release ACTH. What is ACTH? What is that? That's a hormone that causes what? It's going to go where? It's going to go to the adrenal cortex, right? And cause it now to release this cortisol. So we see that this pathway, right? The hypothalamus releases a releasing hormone, tells the anterior pituitary to release this ACTH, and the ACTH then goes to the adrenal cortex, tells it to release cortisol. And the cortisol is now going to tell your body to start breaking down fat, start breaking down protein, start breaking down other molecules, and let your body's metabolism start making from it sugar. Your brain needs to be fed. There's only so long we can do this, right? And this overall process is called gluconeogenesis. Break it down. Genesis, in the beginning, the making of neo, new, sugar. So gluconeogenesis. So this is the stage of resistance. Now, during this time, because your brain needs to maintain as much sugar as it can to survive, it turns out that cortisol actually has a glucose sparing effect. It actually will, will inhibit some molecules so that you don't get too much cortisol. But here's the problem. During this period, it depresses your immune system. When you're stressed out, are you more likely to get sick? Absolutely. Right? So during these times of resistance, your immune system decreases. You are more susceptible to infections, more susceptible to, to ulcers. Your antibody levels can drop. Your wounds can heal more poorly. I mean, overall, you can be in quite a mess. And you're not going to respond normally because your body is so taken up right now by trying to survive through this crisis. At some point, we, we exhaust, I mean, we go through this for a period of time. It can be longer or shorter, depending upon the stress. And at some point, we'll reach a stage of exhaustion. Basically, you have wiped out all of your fat reserves. This will take a long time for me. Right? Right? But wouldn't it, maybe I need more stress in my life. I would love to just kind of go through a few months of, you know, this phase and get rid of this extra fat. But anyway, so... You've, you've exhausted your fat reserves, you've overwhelmed your overall body system, and honestly, at this point, we're talking decline in death. So no one in this room has probably ever been to this extreme end of this because somewhere along the line, that stress is reduced, people come in and help us, our body responds to it, we, 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 we take care of business. Because at some point, right, you've got no more glucose, um, your body can no longer make the glucocorticoids, you no longer can control your kidneys, and basically, as a result, right, you no longer can control your acid levels in your body, and your kidneys say, I give up. And you become acidotic or alkalosis and, and die. Okay? So again, you, you die basically of heart infection or kidney infection or some overwhelming infection because the entire immune system is wiped out. So when you think you're really stressed, Go back and read this and realize you're really not as stressed as you think you might be. But those basic idea, right? This adaptation syndrome, alarm, resistance, exhaustion. And you can, you can put your own experience into that. Uh, you've all experienced stress and you've all experienced some of the physiological responses to it, but thankfully we've never all gone to the point of, of uh, exhaustion. Okay, any thoughts on that little five or six slide story on exhaustion and stress. Again, cortisol, big molecule involved with this. We're learning a lot more about cortisol. 
The last little bit from this chapter is about paracrine signaling. This chapter has been about endocrine, hasn't it? Endocrine meaning hormones released into the bloodstream. But paracrine is another way that molecules communicate with their neighbors. Paracrine is, re is more neighboring rea reactions. So now we're not talking about molecules going through the bloodstream necessarily as we are molecules produced and affecting their neighbor cells. I'm going to introduce a couple of these molecules. These are the paracrines, right? They are messengers that influence short distances or neighboring cells. They are unlike neurotransmitters. They're not made by neurons. They're not like hormones because they're not transported in the blood, right? They're their own class of communicating molecules. You've heard of some of these, but some of these molecules cross over. So for example, uh, histamine. Histamine. When I say histamine, what do you think of? Allergies, right? Some of the cells in your, in your blood will make histamines. But histamine, actually, depending upon where it's made, can be more of a neurotransmitter or can be more of a uh, endocrine molecule. So the line is not always easy to draw between neurotransmitters, hormones, and paracrines. Even catecholamines. Again, when I say catecholamine, you think what? Epinephrine, norepinephrine. And I told you that even though the adrenal cortex and the adrenal medulla were side by side, and while they were different organs, that they did communicate one to another. Well, when the adrenal cortex talks to the adrenal medulla, is that going to be endocrine? No, that's not affecting the whole body. That is just local tissues talking to neighbors. So in that case, these catecholamines would be paracrine. So it's all about place and position and what's going on. Are they, are they released through the blood? Are they released through a neurotransmitter or through a neuron? Or are they released from one cell into the neighboring, into the neighboring environment? So here's an important group of these molecules, the eicosanoids. Now, the eicosanoids are derived from fatty acids. So what does that tell you about them? They must be non-polar, right? These are hydrophobic type of molecules. And let's talk about some of these different molecules. Leukotrienes. Anybody heard of leukotrienes before? Leukotrienes. Uh, these are molecules, they, they, they uh, mediate many of your inflammatory responses. They mediate allergic responses. And there's a, an enzyme, lipooxygenase, right? It's an ACE, it's an enzyme, that we know converts arachidonic acid into leukotrienes. So lipooxygenase, an, an enzyme that converts arachidonic acid into leukotrienes. You'll see why that's important in a moment. There's another enzyme, cyclooxygenase, that converts arachidonic acid into different types of Acosinoids. Maybe you've heard of some of these. Prostacyclins, thromboxins, and prostaglandins. Again, they all have different effects. Um, let's look at the thromboxanes. They are going to help produce platelets after injury. And they are going to stimulate blood clotting, vasoconstriction. So you're thinking wound healing and blood clotting. There's also prostaglandins. You may have heard of prostaglandins before. They are smooth muscle relaxers. So they're going to be important in relaxing smooth muscle of the bronchioles, smooth muscles of the intestines for breathing, uh, also for uh, blood vessel control. So why do I tell you all this? Let's look at this. Um, we're looking at the cell membrane. Cell membrane is made up of phospholipids, right, the, the fatty acids. So I told you that these molecules are derived from fatty acids. So the fatty acids are in the cell membrane, and there are enzymes that are going to convert them to arachidonic acid. This is arachidonic acid. Again, you're not going to memorize it, but it's a fatty acid kind of molecule. And it's derived from the cell membrane. And depending upon which enzymes are around, lipooxygenase or cyclooxygenase, is going to make some leukotrienes or maybe make some of the prostaglandins. They're all related in this family of paracrines. They're all made from the cell membrane. They have different actions, though. Let me clear this and take a look 
this step right here is blocked by steroidal anti-inflammatories. So when you take a steroidal anti-inflammatory, it blocks the production of these, all of these molecules. There's another molecule, another block right here, NSAIDs, such as aspirin and ibuprofen, that blocks this step. So if you take a steroidal anti-inflammatory, it blocks pretty much everything, doesn't it? If you take, however, a non-steroidal, it, it only blocks this, and this can still occur. So why do we choose? Again, I, I'm not going to go into the clinical part of this, but we choose different medications based upon our symptoms of what's going on, and we have to understand that different medications have different blocks in these pathways. So let's take a look at cortisol. Steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs inhibits inflammation by blocking release of that entire thing, and you get no acosinoids made at all. The problem is, who's ever taken steroids before? What are the side effects of steroids? Weight gain. Weight gain. What happens to the face? It starts getting swollen. And we'll see that that's a condition. there's a condition called Cushing syndrome where very characteristic, big moon face. And so if you take steroids long enough, you will create Cushing-like syndrome uh, uh, signs because you'll become more moon face because you're blocking the release of all these acosinoids. If instead I take aspirin or some sort of ibuprofen or like the new Celebrex, these are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, your NSAIDs. They block just one of the um, steps. They don't affect the leukotriene production, and these are very, very important in fever. But also, what does an aspirin a day do for you? Keeps the doctor away or thins your blood. So look what NSAIDs are doing. Aspirin is basically inhibiting those molecules which are important in platelets. So we're kind of inhibiting the platelets, making your blood less likely to clot. So individuals who take an aspirin a day, the 81 milligram tablet, are actually kind of keeping their platelets under control and will minimize blood clotting and the possibility of, of, a, of any sort of blockage. Okay. So just a little bit about those eicosanoids um, and the steroidal, the steroidal um, medications. Let me go through just a couple of, of ideas here on the endocrine system. What can go wrong, basically? And boy, there's a lot that can go wrong with your hormones. So your hormones can be hyposecreted or they can be hypersecreted. You can have hypothyroidism or you can have hyperthyroidism. Some of these you probably have heard of. Let's try to classify them and think about them a little bit. So a hyposecretion, why would you have a hyposecretion? Why would your body be making less hormone? It could be you have a tumor, and that tumor is somehow destroying the gland or is interfering with the release or is interfering with the ability to receive the signals. So you can have a head trauma. You can knock your head and destroy your pituitary's ability to release ADH. Now, which pituitary am I talking about here? Posterior, Posterior pituitary. So you can have a head injury, cause, your, cause damage to your posterior pituitary, no longer make ADH, and have a disease called diabetes insipidus. In this condition, it's not a, it's not a molecule about <laughs> insulin, but what are one of the, what's one of the other symptoms of diabetes? Thirst. Thirst and polyuria or excessive urination. And so the diabetes insipidus has nothing to do with insulin, but because you've lost your ADH, you're urinating constantly. These individuals lose their antidiuretic hormone. They lose the ability to control urination, and they will urinate 30 to 50 liters a day. So they're constantly drinking, and they're constantly urinating, and they really have no control over it. Okay? There also could be some sort of autoimmune disease that is causing you to damage your glands. 
So you name it, there's all sorts of reasons why the body would no longer make enough of a particular hormone, and there are usually consequences of that. Or you could be hypersecreting a hormone. You could be overly releasing it. Now, tumors can do this too. Tumors can be actively growing, and if that tumor cell is itself releasing the hormone, you would have a lot of it. You can also have autoimmune diseases that also upregulate hormones. A couple here that you may have heard about, pheochromocytoma. Okay, pheochromocytoma, this is a tumor of the adrenal medulla. We're now releasing too much epinephrine and norepinephrine. Or you could have Graves' disease, and this is where uh, you have autoantibodies, uh, antibodies your body is making on its own, but they are mimicking the effects of TSH. Now, what is TSH again? Thyroid stimulating hormone, right? I want you to think about this and pull it back to what we've been doing. So if your body is making too much TSH, TSH is usually released by where? Thyroid-stimulating hormone is released by the anterior pituitary. And where does it go? It goes to the thyroid. It stimulates the thyroid to make more thyroid hormone. Okay? But what if you have thyroid hypersecretion? Some of the effects of this, you may know what happens with hyper thyroid, your overall metabolism, your body weight will go down, okay? And there are a lot of other effects as well. So basically, you have an antibody that is mimicking the effects of TSH. In other words, it's like it's TSH. It's telling the thyroid hormone to stay on, and it's overproducing thyroid hormone, which can give you what's called Graves' disease, and I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. There also can be other hypersecretion disorders. One would be acromegaly. What does acro mean? Acro? Extreme. Megaly, enlargement. So acromegaly would be basically Shrek. Andre the Giant and Shrek. So though that, you know, Shrek is really a cartoon representation of a person who has acromegaly. What happens is that after puberty, they start overproducing growth hormone. They're of normal height, but their extremities, their face, their hands, some of their features, their nose gets very, very large. Look at this woman here. She is a textbook example of uh, acromegaly. Beautiful young lady, normal in her teenage years, starting to look a little bit more Andre the Giant-like at 33, and by 60 or whatever she is, 52, you see she has much larger facial features, very large hands. So acromegaly, the bones of the hand, the bones of the face continue to grow because of this overproduction of growth hormone. But what if that growth hormone overproduction occurs before puberty, before the person reaches their adult height? Now that growth hormone can cause giantism. And this is now the TLC shows with the seven-foot giant in China, right? A person has, an anterior, has a pituitary gland tumor. That tumor is overproducing growth hormone. They never reach their adult height, so their epiphyseal plates are still open, and they're still continuing to grow taller and taller and taller. So we get giantism. The only difference here is the timing. When did the overproduction of growth hormone start? If it starts before puberty or before they've reached their adult height, you could be giantism. If it doesn't start till after puberty and they've reached their adult height, then they could have acromegaly. It's all pretty much the same. We don't see pituitary dwarfism. I mean, are there examples of people who don't produce enough growth hormone? Yes. But in our day and age, a child walks in and he's under the fifth percentile in the growth chart, they may give him growth hormone synthetic growth hormone to cause him to grow taller. So we don't see dwarfism very much because the hyposecretion we take care of medically, at least in this country. D giantism, right, how do we stop this tumor? We've got to go into the pituitary gland and sometimes we can't get there, it's inoperable. And so the tumor will continue to you know, secrete excess growth hormone and these people will die basically of being too tall. Uh, their heart, their cardiovascular system gives out and their joints 
give out. It's just too much weight on their body. See, they'll keep on growing, but at some point the heart can no longer pump that, you know, you know, that increased height is a real strain on the heart. And all that extra weight is an increased strain on the knees and the joints, and they just start having lots of issues. Okay, so we see that hormones can be out of control, high or low. Um, again, you could have congenital hypothyroidism. Okay, break it down. It's because from birth, right, from the time of birth, you had not enough thyroid. Okay, so you have hyposecretion, and we can treat that. Anyone who now has hyposecretion of their thyroid hormone, we can give them medications. So medically, not a big deal. See an endocrinologist, see your general doctor. We can treat these pretty well. Uh, myxedema, basically this is adult hypothyroidism. Again, we give you meds. So as an adult, you find that you're not making enough thyroid hormone, then we can give you some. What are the symptoms of people who don't have enough thyroid? If you're hypothyroid, what are some of the symptoms? Weight gain, right? Oftentimes weight gain, lethargy would be some of the signals, signs of someone whose thyroid is low. If there's a problem with the thyroid, you can get a goiter. A goiter is an enlargement of the thyroid gland. There can be two types, endemic or toxic. Now, we don't see endemic goiters anymore because they're related to iodine deficiency. We don't have that anymore because about 100 years ago, Mr. Morton got with the U.S. government. We started putting iodine in our salt, so we now have plenty of iodine. We no longer in this country have any issue with endemic goiters. 100 years ago? Yeah. People walked around with big goiters. They didn't have enough iodine in their diet. However, there's still Graves' disease. That was what I've already mentioned. And this is where there is a, an antibody that's mimicking TSH, causing an overproduction of thyroid hormone. This is an endemic goiter. We don't see this anymore. Right? This is a, an enlargement of the thyroid gland from a lack of iodine. No, no longer an issue in our country. Uh, what about parathyroidism? Okay, remember parathyroid. Now, where is this hormone made from? It's parathyroid, right? Don't make this in hard. And the parathyroid, we'll talk about in a few minutes, is related to calcium regulation. If you have hypoparathyroidism, it's probably because you had your thyroid gland removed, and with it, you lost your parathyroid glands. Remember where they are? They're little tiny dots, if you will, on the back of the thyroid. So if you have your thyroid removed, you might also have your parathyroid removed. If you do not fix this, you'll be dead. So is the parathyroid important? Yes. Absolutely. Why? Because without it, you'll have a decline in calcium. Now, we've already talked about how important calcium is in the nervous system, but calcium, we'll see in the next exam, is hugely important in your muscles. And if you don't have calcium, your muscles will go into fat fatal tetany. They'll go into tetanus. They'll go into a rigor, and you won't be able to get out of it, and you'll die, basically, of not being able to breathe, right? Your diaphragm will also go into tetany, and you'll no longer be able to breathe. So we need our parathyroid, or else we lose our calcium regulation, and we die of muscle issues. You can also have too much parathyroid, hyperparathyroidism. And this would usually be caused by a tumor, overproduction. Now you don't have enough calcium, um, and what happens is that, or sorry, they go up. Sorry, the calcium levels go way high, and they go way, way up high. Your bones become soft as a result and deformed, and this is where you start getting lots of kidney stones, renal calculi. What is, what is calculus besides math? Hard, right? Hard math, right? So calculus is hard stuff. So calculi, right? Renal calculi would be kidney stones. Why do we get kidney stones? Because there's a high amount of calcium and phosphate both around. And when calcium and phosphate both hang out together, they make, they make little oysters, right? They make little stones. Remember when we were talking about body levels and fluid levels? I always said wherever calcium is high, phosphate will be low. And we can't have them both high in the same place because we start forming little stones. Last couple of these. Cushing syndrome. High cortisol. So you're sort of in this chronic stage of, of stress. That could do it as well. So you're hyperglycemic, you're hypertensive, 
What did I tell you? Cortisol does what? Cortisol caused your body to make more sugar, gluconeogenesis. It caused your blood sugar to go, or your blood sugar and your blood pressure to go up, so you become hypertensive with this. Um, you become to retain fluid. Remember I told you the aldosterone was retaining fluid and sodium, so you become edemic, okay? And you also start losing lots of protein because your body's breaking down those proteins to make more glucose. The, the symptom here, though, what you're going to notice is that these individuals have that abnormal face fat, that Cushing syndrome, that moon face, which some people on steroids start to look like if they've been on steroids for a while. They also get a buffalo hump, if you will, in their back. So they get this big fat pad in their upper shoulder, back area, and they get this big fat accumulation in their face, very characteristic of Cushing's. Typically, when Cushing comes along, there's also adrenal androgen hypersecretion, and this is going to be um, too many what? Let's look at this. Adrenal androgens, too much testosterone-like molecules, and this is going to cause enlargement of sexual organs in children. It could masculinize genitalia in women, so little girls start looking more like little penises. Um, the clitoris enlarges and the, it will also cause masculinization. So uh, facial hair will occur. Uh, women who have a renal, sorry, have an adrenal tumor will oftentimes start getting facial hair. The voice will start to lower. They'll start getting some coarse changes in their body, more like a masculine type appearance. So there's our moon shape, right? Our moon face of Cushing's. You can't appreciate it, but there's also a large amount of fat that's accumulating in the upper back area, that buffalo hump and all this fat in the face. So the big moon cheeks, very characteristic of Cushing syndrome. The last uh, disease I want to mention related to the endocrine system is diabetes. Uh, we know probably the most about this one. You've at least experienced this or know somebody who has diabetes. And this is by far the most prevalent metabolic or endocrine disorder in the world. Basically, you're disrupting insulin. You're, you're messing around with insulin or the regulation thereof. Symptoms? Polyuria, number one, excessive urination. If you go to the doctor and you complain about getting up oftentimes during the middle of the night to go to the restroom, they're going to screen you for your blood sugar. They're going to think maybe you're showing signs of polyuria and early signs of diabetes. Polydipsia, well, to make up for all that urination, you need to be drinking. So you're going to have a, a, a very strong sense of thirst and polyphagia, hunger, lots of hunger to keep up with this metabolic change. So this is going to show up in blood glucose tests. You're going to have an elevated blood glucose. And you may also have um, ketones, which are uh, a metabolic breakdown of some of this abnormal metabolism also showing up in the urine. How much glucose should you have in your urine? None. I mean, a normal meta metabolism, all the sugar is reabsorbed by your kidneys. And how much sugar ends up in your urine should be zero. Now, it might be a little bit if you just had you know, a 44-ounce Slurpee or something for a short moment. For the most part, though, a normal metabolism will recapture all of that glucose uh, as the normal part of the reabsorption of the kidney. In diabetes, there is so much sugar in the blood that the kidneys cannot, as it's filtering it, keep up with reabsorbing all that sugar. So some of the sugar does begin to, quote, spill over or appear in the urine. And so a diabetic is characterized, tested by the presence of glucose in his or her urine. Also the timing of it. So if you have um, a little bit of sugar in your urine after you just had a big sugary meal, eh, maybe not a big deal. If you've been fasting for eight hours and you still have glucose in your urine, pretty good sign that your sugar is pretty high all the time and that you have diabetes. Now, there's different types of diabetes. Let me describe a couple of them. Type 1, what used to be called uh, uh, juvenile diabetes, no longer is using that term, uh, but this is an insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, so IDDM, insulin-dependent. And this accounts for the smaller number of insulin, or sorry, of diabetic cases in the country. Uh, Insulin is absolutely necessary to treat this. This is a disease where, for whatever reason, the beta cells of the pancreas, remember the insulin's made in the beta cells, and the beta cells no longer are producing insulin. 
we don't understand it. If it's a viral attack, if it's an autoimmune disorder, uh, there might be a slight genetic component to it, but we really don't understand what brings this on. But for whatever reason, there is a destruction of the beta cells, and we no longer have insulin being produced. You must give it to them in an injectable. The second type of diabetes, far more common, becoming more prevalent in our society, is type 2, non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus, NIDDM. This is by far the most common. It's not a problem initially of the pancreas not making insulin. The body's still making plenty of insulin. The problem with type 2 is the receptor. Remember, a hormone is only as good as its receptor. So in type 2, the body's still making insulin but the cells no longer are responding to it. It's an issue with the receptor. We don't completely understand this one either, but we know that obesity and a lot of genetics involved with this one. If you have a sibling with diabetes, there's a 50% chance that you also will have type 2 diabetes. If you have a parent with one parent with type 2 diabetes, the numbers are not good, but with two parents with type 2 diabetes, it's, it's, it's not a given there's a very, very high chance that you too will have type 2 diabetes in your lifetime. So we can do a lot to fight it, but we can't necessarily take over all the genetics of it. You also are at higher risk if you're over 40 and of certain ethnicities. Treatment, exercise can work with this because we know that uh, fat cells, adipose, speaks to your blood regulation and to your receptors, and just a 10% reduction in your body mass can have a rather significant improvement on your overall diabetic state. Um, you want to treat with weight loss and with exercise um, because we know that there's going to be a loss of muscle mass um, that's occurring with this, and um, we know that more fat on your body interferes with your glucose metabolism. So get rid of some of the fat. You'll minimize some of the problems with type 2 diabetes. Meds, a lot of meds out there. There's a whole brand new group of meds coming out um, that I just read about. Maybe not brand new, but I just got wind of them that are dealing with... Um, reabsorption of sugar. So there's another level of control. We've got meds that stop making sugar in the liver, and we've got other meds. Now there's going to be a new med that's going to help to increase the reabsorption of the kidneys. And I, I'm not sure I got all that mechanism down, but it's a, it's, it's a new exciting um, mechanism for treating diabetes. So what's going on here? What's the problem with having high blood sugar? The, pathogenis the pathogenesis of this. What's the problem with this? Well, cells... Um, cannot absorb glucose, right? Because what am I telling you? The receptor's not there. Let me back up. What does insulin do? You just eat a sugary meal, right? You just had a meal. Should be sugar, potatoes, starches, whatever. You just had a meal. Your body releases insulin. And what does that insulin tell the body? Let's have a party. Eat the glucose. So it, so it tells the cells to start accepting glucose in. Okay, so if you no longer have insulin going on, then the cells basically aren't doing what? They're not getting the energy that they need. So the cells are no longer absorbing the glucose that they need because they've lost this regulation. Now they must rely upon fats and proteins for their energy. And when they break that down, there can be some weakness. Now this is more going back to type one. And as a result of breaking down all these fats, they get ketones in their blood. Now, for most people, a little bit of ketones is not a problem, but in a type 1 diabetic, ketoacidosis is a sign that things are really out of whack and can be a really serious problem because those ketones can decrease the blood pH. And we know enough about this to know that if the blood pH drops and we become acidotic, that we can be in trouble very quickly. So this will cause breathing issues, right? So we can go in to become ketoacidotic. It lowers the blood pH and now we start having some, some breathing issues and can lead to diabetic coma. So that's on the, on the extreme end of this, okay? The other thing though, what else can happen with high sugar long term? Chronic hyperglycemia. High sugar we know damages the nerves and damages the blood vessels and can lead to some changes, um, especially in the retina and in the kidneys. So some of the long-term side effects of diabetes, if not well controlled, are issues with, with sight and retina and blindness and issues with kidneys having to go on dialysis because the blood vessels of the kidneys are sensitive. Also, and that's more common with type 1, 
So the side effects, the long-term side effects of unregulated type 1 diabetes can be blindness and uh, kidney issues. With type 2, it's more macrovascular. So type 2 diabetes, the issues are more heart failure. So type 1, think microvascular, vessels, nerves, and blood vessel uh, uh, capillaries. And in type 2, it's more large vessels, think heart disease. Yeah, so that's exactly. So that high sugar is damaging the nerves. So that diabetic neuropathy, exactly. So that high sugar over time damages the nerves, and the nerves start to die off, and the issue with that is pain. Okay, so the nerves are damaged. So there's dysfunction in the nerves. That also leads to, can lead to poor wound healing and to lack of sensation in the lower limbs. And if those lower limbs get infected, can lead to amputation. So it, it's a really ugly progression, which is why maintaining blood glucose levels is so important. No matter what type of diabetic one is, keeping blood sugar levels controlled and managed is huge to minimizing any of these potential issues in the future. So what have I told you? In the end, I've given you seven or eight different diseases related to hyper or hyposecretion of hormones. That, those are the important hormones, okay? So the hormones I just mentioned are the more important ones. So make sure that those are the ones that you're focusing on as you look back and start categorizing these hormones for Chapter 17. It's a lot of information, isn't it? It is. I, 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 I'm, I'm not going to sit here and suggest that it's not. It's a lot of information, and we don't have a lot of time, right? And um, so, so we call it college, right? Lots of stuff to learn. Um, let me give you a little glimpse into the exam before I move on. Okay. So, so that everyone is, is up to speed with what to expect on the exam. Same format as before. Starts off with some true faults. You love those. And then we get into some multiple choice questions. Again, these chapters are over what? 15? Autonomic nervous system, 17, and what I continue through here in a few minutes with the other. Um, how many questions do we have here? It looks like about, about 100 multiple choice questions. Uh, can you? So kind. 40 true false. 40 true false. It's A or B. Okay. 50-50. <laughs> then at the end, I told you in that email last week that I want you to be able to compare and contrast um, autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic versus the parasympathetic. For those who had me in 105, maybe you can already imagine what I'm going to show you here. I got word, thank you for emailing me, that whenever I write on the tablet that my words are being mumbled. And what I discovered is that I'm grabbing the tablet, and whenever I'm writing on the tablet, my palm has been right over the microphone. <coughs> I, didn't, I wasn't aware of that. So now I know to hold it the other way and not put my hand over the microphone. So when I write on this, you can now hear me. Now, for the, for the comparisons, I'm going to have a Venn diagram. Okay. And I have two of these Venn diagrams on the exam. And one will be for, let's say, A is for the uh, sympathetic nervous system. And B is for the parasympathetic nervous system. C would be for the, if the fact that I give you is true for both. And D would be for neither. And what I'll do is I'll give you some facts. Right? So fact number one, um, regulates homeostasis. And you know that both of those systems, sympathetic and parasympathetic, are involved with regulating homeostasis, so you would bubble in C, because it's both. And if I said, oh, I don't know, is voluntary. Neither, right? Because both the sympathetic and parasympathetic are part of the autonomic, automatic nervous system. Neither is voluntary. So if I said voluntary, the answer would be? D, because that applies to neither of these two divisions. So there'll be about 10 facts or so, and you'll place them in the correct circle. 
There will be another Venn diagram similar to this for the endocrine system versus the nervous system. And I'll give, I'll give you some factoids. Is If I said neurotransmitters work exclusively through neurotransmitters, you would say nervous system, right? And if I said sends electrical signals, you would say nervous system. If I said instead uses hormones, you might go over to the endocrine side, or you might read my question really carefully and say, okay, is he saying, because sometimes they cross over, don't they? Okay, so read my question, and that's where you're kind of dividing and, and conquering the endocrine versus the nervous system. So the same idea, another Venn diagram. So one diagram is endocrine versus nervous. The other one is sympathetic versus parasympathetic. And then that'll be the exam. That exam, full-length exam, all you need is a Scantron form. That exam will be in the blue and gold room as it was last time, 4 o'clock on Thursday. Those who are in hybrid have already received an email from me saying, tell me when you're going to take the exam in the testing center, or are you instead taking it with me on Thursday with everybody else? Okay? So that's, that's the deal for the exam. No short answer. Thank you. No short answer on this exam. So instead, focus on these compare and contrasting ideas of the nervous system and the endocrine system. How are we doing? Feeling more confident? Less confident? OK. Um, how many hours in two days? 48 hours. In 49 hours, this too shall be over. Right? OK. OK, so let's go. What's that? About 150. Yeah, you're not going to be crunched for time. This is the same exam I give during the regular semester, and they have an hour and a half. And here I'm giving you the full two hours. So not a problem. Not a problem. Chapter 7. Now, I know this is a little out of order in your notes, isn't it? Didn't muscle come before bones in your note kits or your note pack? Or am I wrong? Okay, so I fixed it. Okay, at one point it was out. So you're going uh, into a little bit about bone and tissue. Tell me about bone. Let me, let me popcorn out some ideas about bone. They're spongy and compact. Good. Red bone marrow, where blood production is actively occurring, versus yellow bone marrow, which is basically fat. What else do we know? What kind of cells? Osteoblasts, which are making new bone, osteoclasts, right? Osteoclasts are a totally different kind of cell that are breaking bone down. When these cells break bone down, they're releasing calcium into the bloodstream. There was another cell, osteoblasts built, osteocytes were the cells that stopped building, but now were cocooned, right, within the lacuna. We know a little bit about the canaliculi and the basic structures of bone, okay? So the first 27 slides here are, again, just a really quick review. I'm going to bl blow through them very, very quickly here. I think as you read through them, you'll have no trouble. Let me just get to the couple, two or three things that are relatively new. Now, the skeleton is not just this box of bones or this set of sticks, right? We know that it has an incredible metabolism. We are learning how bones talk to the brain. We are learning through hormone signals. We're learning how bones affect overall metabolism. Bones, there are actually hormones made by your bones that influence your, your digestive system and vice versa. So there's a lot of really cool interactions that we're just now beginning over the last decade or so to start to tease out. So we have a very dynamic system here with lots of interactions with other body systems. We know all about support, protection, movement. We know that calcium and phosphate are stored there. And we'll see also that there are buffers in the blood, uh, made in the bone, in the blood, that are helping to, to uh, change against pH changes. And of course, hemopoiesis is occurring in your blood. I'm not going to go back through the general features of bones. You know your long bone anatomy you know, the periosteum and all that, not a problem there. Diaphysis, epiphysis. Um, when we look at bones, this is flat bone, isn't it? Flat bone, like from the skull. And how is it a little bit different? 
it's two layers of compact bone with a little bit of spongy bone in the middle, a little Oreo cookie of all that. We recall that there are four types of cells in bone. I've already mentioned three of them. So let's, let's go. Osteoblasts. What are they doing? They are building. And the part that we know they're building because they have blast in them. And what does blast tell us? Generating or building, right? Then there are osteocytes. Sorry, my pen's on the wrong color. That's the problem. So then there are osteocytes. Osteocytes are the cells that used to be building bone, but now are cocooned. They, they've made bone around themselves, and now they are in the lacunae. Osteoclast, a totally different kind of cell, breaking down bone. Clast means to break down. And then the cell from which they are derived, at least osteogenic cells, make the osteoblasts, which then become osteocytes. They're like the stem cells, right? So they're the cells hanging out. When you break a bone, your osteogenic cells start making more osteoblasts so that you can create more bone. So we know bone's a connective tissue, and we know um, that, it, therefore, it's loosely packed cells surrounded by ground substance and protein fibers. We've already said all this. So the osteogenic cells, some books call them the osteoprogenitor cells, these are the stem cells. They're going to be there to continuously produce new osteoblasts throughout your life. Osteoblasts are the bone forming cells. They are lining up and create more cells like themselves. And these are the cells, interesting, that secrete osteocalcin. Osteocalcin. Hmm. Sounds like a protein that must somehow be involved with bone and calcium, right? Osteocalcin. And it turns out that this hormone made by the bone stimulates insulin. Who to thunk it, right? That your bones have an impact on your insulin levels. So exercise not only is stimulating more, uh, more muscle and less fat, but also it's causing the bones to release more of this osteocalcin. And uh, we know, too, that this osteocalcin increases the sensitivity of insulin, which can limit the amount of adipose. So you tell me, what causes obesity? A lack of activity? Perhaps, but also we're seeing here that with more activity, the bones are putting out this hormone that actually does reduce fat. So, yeah, it all makes sense. Grandma was right, right? Have you seen that new commercial? Oh, that new commercial. The kid's on his video. video he's calling his grandmother on his cell phone to come bring me a pop. And, he, and he's been told to uh, do the, uh, break the yard, and he's sitting in a chair with a leaf blower, and he's blow, le blowing the leaves around, and it's like you know the epitome of a lazy kid, right? And it's just this great little commercial. If you see it, you'll laugh. But he's calling his grandmother, who's elderly, who gets out of a chair to go to the refrigerator to get him a pop because he's watching his video games. Anyway, you'll appreciate it, okay? <laughs> so what are osteocytes? Osteocytes are cells that are sort of in semi-retirement, They've already built their home. They've already built the bone. They have created their own little space in which they reside. And that space is the lacunae. We've been through this. And they communicate through little cracks or canals called canaliculi. And we'll see that the cells reach out. I'll show you a great picture in a moment. And they reach into those canaliculi so that they can uh, communicate one with another. Again, lots of stuff going on. And when a bone is stressed, it will regulate more bone remodeling. Your bones are constantly changing their shape throughout your lifespan a little bit at a time. And if you look at a person who's 90, right, and you see those kyphotic changes, some changes in their overall skeleton, didn't happen overnight, but clearly our bones are constantly changing throughout our lifespan. So this is a great picture of an osteocyte. Here's the cell, and it's got these processes, these cytoplasmic processes that are reaching out and actually reaching into the canaliculi. So you can see them kind of reaching out and they're going into the cracks. So these cells are communicating with one another and they're sending out signals through these little cracks to neighboring cells. Really cool little cells. 
Osteoclast, totally different cell. Remember, these are the bone dissolving cells. They are really macrophages. They are uh, cells that are breaking things down. They have huge numbers of lysosomes. They are multinucleated. They are huge in their size, and they rest in the bone. And you can see wherever they sit, they cause a ruffled border. They basically um, resorb away the bone and create a space where they live because these cells are also releasing hydrochloric acid. Right? Hydrochloric acid, acid degrades bone. Acid breaks down calcium. And so it's releasing this hydrochloric acid, leaving a what's called a house ship's lacunae around, basically a pit where a pit where you can see where the osteoclasts is hanging out. And constantly the osteoclasts are working in they're working in, in concert with the osteoblasts keeping your bone metabolism happy, resorbing and depositing bone as needed. What is your bone made up of? Remember, it's a connective tissue. Therefore, it's loosely packed cells. So what's outside of those loosely packed cells? We would call it ground substance or extracellular matrix. So what's out there? There's both organic and inorganic materials. What's organic? Remember anything with a carbon in it? So there's lots of collagen. There's lots of proteins, um, lots of, um, especially think collagen, right? Collagen is very much a steel-like molecule. It's a, mo it's a macromolecule. It's organic. In addition to those molecules, though, you also have inorganic matter within the extracellular matrix. And this is a calcium phosphate salt, and it has a fun name, hydroxyapatite. So hydroxyapatite is the name of this stuff where calcium and phosphate come together and make this mineral-like material. There's other minerals in there as well, but that's the big one. That's right. So here, the calcium and phosphate create a stone. They create bone. So we want them both there. But we wouldn't want them together anywhere else, right? Because if you have calcium and phosphate together anywhere else, you create basically hydroxyapatite, and you get stones, kidney stones, liver stones, you name it you get buildup of bad stuff in the wrong place. So bone, therefore, is a composite. It's a combination of both the organic and the inorganic. It's a, it's a combination of the living and the non-living. And together, those two components, the steel, collagen, and the hydroxyapatite, create something even stronger than they could alone. So there's some synergy going on there, isn't there? So we have the hard mineral and the strength of the collagen together giving us this very strong bone. Now, there are two diseases that can affect bone. One, rickets. Rickets, we don't see it anymore much, but it's a deficiency in calcium. OK, so you're not making enough calcium. Therefore, your bones would not be as strong as they need to be. Do you remember in lab, if you took lab the last couple of years, I usually had a demo bone in the back, and one was baked at high temperature, and one bone was dipped in acid for the weekend? And the one that was dipped in acid, what <coughs> happened to it? it? Became very soft, very pliable. That's rickets. So the bones become, you've, you've etched away at all the calcium. That acid eats away at the calcium. You're left with strength, but strong, or but weak, uh, sorry. Strong but weak, let me rephrase. You're left with strong collagen, but very flimsy, right? So it's a very weak, soft bone. So that's rickets. It can be a dietary issue to the extreme where you get softer bones. There's also osteogenesis imperfecta. This is also called the brittle bone disease. Here, you have a deficiency, a mutation in collagen. So now your bones are going to be very brittle. This is as if you baked the bone at 450 degrees for a few hours. You take the bone out, and you could crack it, right? It's, it, it has, what's happened? The heat has done what to the collagen? What's the word I'm looking for? When we heat up proteins, they denature. We destroy the protein. So these, uh, the heat didn't destroy the calcium, right? So in osteogenesis imperfecta, there's a problem with, cal with uh, collagen. Calcium is fine. The collagen is deficient, 
So now they're not very strong, but they are very, very brittle. You've seen the histology here. I'm not going to quiz you on the histology. Um, we're looking at that birthday cake model type picture, and we see all those central canals. And what's connecting the central canals are the Volkmann canals, right? Those connectors, the perforating or Volkmann canals. Spongy bone, we never looked at it under the microscope. Boy, it looks a lot different, right? It doesn't have the osteons. Instead, it has a, uh, a trabeculate, sort of this, this maze appearance. So we would say that there are thin plates of bones called trabeculae. And also within this, um, these slivers, these spicules and trabeculae, there are spaces filled with red bone marrow. And this is where the active hematopoiesis is going on. No central canals, really not arranged in osteons, very different, doesn't really provide um, very much weight. It does provide some strength. That matrix, that trabeculae does provide some strength, but it does so at a much lesser weight, so we don't have to walk around with solid bones. I'm not going to ask you to see this under the microscope, but you can appreciate that spongy in nature to, or of the trabeculae in the spongy bone. So where are you, where are you right now actively making blood? Where, what bones in your body are actively producing blood? Okay, it's mostly, it, it's actually flat bones, most of them, and the proximal ends of your femur and of your humerus. So it's the proximal end of your femur, proximal end of your humerus, and then flat bones. Remember your skull bones are largely flat bones. Your ribs are considered flat bones. Your oscoxa has a lot, right? Your hip bone has a lot of blood production going on. And your sternum. So pretty much, and, I didn't say it, I don't think, your vertebra. So some of the funky shaped bones, the irregular bones, the vertebra, and the flat bones of your face and of your skull, and the proximal ends of your humerus and femur. The rest of those long bones really aren't involved. So the little fingers of your, you know, your phalanges, your hum uh, the rest of your radius, your ona, your tibia, nothing's going on there. Maybe a little bit of it did when you were younger as a, as a fetus or early in life, but as an adult, all that has been converted to yellow and is no longer actively hemopoietic. So there is a list. I just showed you the picture. Here's the list of bones. So where do you still have active blood production? There you go. Everything else is yellow. No longer produces blood. Just a couple of things about bone development. A couple of things about that cartilage to bone transition. That's largely review. And then a little bit about fractures. And then finally, a little bit about homeostasis. So that's what we've got left dealing with the skeletal system. So when you think about the overall development of bone, this would be the process of osteogenesis, the formation or making of bone. You also could call it ossification. And in you and me, um, there are two ways by which we get bone. There is intramembranous ossification and there is endochondrial ossification. Two different ways of making bone. Let's go through them quickly. Intramembranous sounds like it happens, what, within? a membrane. And this is what is going to produce your flat bones of your skull and your clavicle. Okay, so that's what we're dealing with. Flat bones and your clavicle making up or being made by this type of intramembranous ossification. Versus, okay, and you can see here what's kind of happening. You can see these layers being formed. Uh, remember that this is a the flat bones are the diploid with the two layers of compact bone with the middle layer of spongy bone in between. So that's the intramembranous ossification. However, most of your bones are being produced by endochondrial, which tells us what? That they were first cartilage, right? So these are your bones that were first cartilage. What kind of cartilage? Specifically, hyaline, hyaline. cartilage. Hyaline means glassy or transparent. It's a very translucent tissue. If you've ever seen a, a, a fetus, three or four month old fetus, 
uh, in, a, in a jar in some sort of display and with backlighting, you can see right through their skeletal system because those bones are still at that point cartilage and are still very, very clear. So what basically starts is you start off with a chunk of cartilage. Now where that comes from, we won't worry about right now, right? But we start off with a chunk of cartilage. And that cartilage, remember cartilage is avascular. There are no blood vessels there. Uh, there are chondrocytes there that make up the cartilage. And with, with signals, hormonal signals, there's going to be vascular invasion. Basically, blood flow is going to invade into that cartilage. Now, those chondrocytes are accustomed to being in an oxygen-free environment. And with that blood comes oxygen. And those chondrocytes now are changed, differentiated into osteocytes. And they now are bone-like cells. And so now the inside starts to look more like bone. It is vascular. Okay. Now that's what happens in the center or the diaphysis of the bone. That's where it happens first. So that's called the primary ossification center. Then on the two ends, on the two epiphyses, there's also going to be a secondary ossification center. Blood's going to come in at the two epiphyses and set up the same kind of shop. But what happens is that there remains a space <coughs> where blood never invaded. And that we better know as the growth plate. And it's from there that the bones will continue to grow, but first as cartilage. So while the rest of the bone is, quote, bone, at the growth plate, we're still dealing with chondroblasts that are still making more cartilage. And they're dividing, and your bones are now growing from their two ends, from the epiphyses. Now what happens is that at adult height, under hormonal control, that growth plate closes and now is replaced by an epiphyseal line, not so obvious in this particular cartoon, but in some pictures it'll be really overemphasized or well um, shown. And that epiphyseal line tells you that that bone is no longer growing longer. It has reached its adult height. The growth plate's gone. The cartilage is gone. And now the entire bone from one end to the other maintains a bone-like nature. We still would find cartilage where, though? We would still find cartilage on the two ends. That's a, That's still what kind of cartilage? That is hyaline cartilage again, right? Now that's the articulating cartilage that bones depend upon for smooth gliding over one another in the joint space. So remember that little story about endochondrial ossification is first um, cartilage, then bone. Now this happens through a series of steps as you could imagine, and we call these the zones. And this starts, um, I mean, some bones are becoming completely ossified by age eight. Others are waiting until the early 20s. And um, basically by late teens or early 20s, all of the cartilage in your bones, all of your growth plates are going to be fused down and you've reached your final uh, height. So those, the gap will be closed down, minimized, the diaphysis closes down, and everything becomes one big bony structure. Again, if you were to look at about a three-month-old fetus and held a light up to it, you would see, aren't these cute little hands cute, right? The little metacarpals and the little meta, all the little phalanges. You can see they haven't articulated one with another, a lot of space in between them, but you can truly see translucency through this. It's a very, very thin skeleton. Where you will see denser bone would be in the skull because those were not made by the same process. That's where those intramembranous ossification was occurring. So it's not as translucent because it wasn't cartilage. That's starting from a different process. So some of those skull bones would appear thicker, more dense than the others. So that's how bones are formed. And then how do bones grow? And how do they continue throughout our life to remodel? Well, we're not. We know this. We know that bones grow longer in length, and they grow bigger in diameter. No surprise there. So how do they grow longer? Epiphyseal plate, right? And the growth plate is uh, growing from the two, long, two ends. And this whole area, this epiphyseal plate, is said to be in the metaphysis. Now, that's a new word, perhaps. We've had diaphysis and epiphysis. Now we have the metaphysis, and this is a zone sort of in the middle in between the two. Let me show you the picture in a moment. 
Look at this x-ray of a young child. Right? What do you notice here? Yeah, the metacarpals and all the phalanges. But do you notice, these are all long bones, aren't they? Now, the joint is actually here. But do you see there's a, there's a gap here? Yeah. And, a, and there's a growth plate, growth plate, growth plate. There's actually a little bit of a gap in there. You can see it really nicely here. You can see it here. And so that represents that open space. This kid has not, his hand is not as big as it's going to be. Right? There's still the opportunity for growth because we see that the growth plates have not closed. Now, the metaphysis, again, is this area where we're transitioning from cartilage to bone, and it's described as being in five zones. Not that tough, the names sort of name for themselves. So we're going to start off with going from cartilage to bone. So zone one is regular old cartilage, right? It's regular cartilage at the edge of this transition. And then some of these chondrocytes are going to begin to multiply. So we call this a zone of proliferation. The cells are proliferating. Then the cells get bigger. They stop dividing, but they get larger in size. So that's the zone of hypertrophy. And then they start to undergo their calcification changes. So that's the zone of calcification. And eventually, we are bone. So it's just a transition from cartilage to bone, going through these five steps. They're color-coded for us here in this picture. But we're going from eyeballs, right? Remember eyeballs and cartilage? And if we see it, they change. They start dividing. Then they get larger. Then they become bone-like. And now they truly are bone. So there's just this continuation from cartilage to bone. Not only do bones lengthen, but they also get wider and thicker. This is called inter, um, interstitial growth is increasing in length at the epiphyseal uh, plates. And then we're also going to have the lengthening, or, or sorry, that was lengthening, and width increase is going to be appositional growth. So this is going to happen as you think about a long bone, when you think about an osteon, right? We know that osteons are in those cylindrical structures with layers, those lamellae. And your whole bone sort of does the same thing. It starts laying down these layers, these circumferential lamellae. And this is going to, over time, increase the overall diameter of the bone, and it's going to enlarge the marrow cavity. So you've got this widening and thickening going on, and this happens throughout your lifespan. Certainly, we're growing more bone, lengthening more bone during our childhood years, but then during our adult years, we're in sort of a steady state equilibrium, and we're still remodeling our bones. You still have micro fractures, things you're not even aware of little breaks in your bones that are being repaired. You still have the release of minerals. You still have osteoclasts and osteoblasts working back and forth to rebuild your bone. That changing of your bones throughout the lifespan is known to be, or was described by Wolf. And so he gets credit. Wolf's law of bone. And basically what he described is that the architecture of your bones are determined by the mechanical stresses put on your bones to adapt in so that the bones are withstanding less stress or are allowed to, to endure that stress. Ever think about why your bones are the shape they are, right? Different muscles are pulling on them. So as muscles are pulling, you're putting stress on the bones, and the bones are responding to that stress by changing their shape and their size. Another way of thinking about Wolf's Law is that use it or lose it as well, because if we're not continuing to put stress on our bones, they will basically shut down. So it's very important not only for shaping our bones and this constant recycling and remodeling of our bones, but if we stop putting stress on our bones, then we will no longer have bone development as robust as it is. So we want to keep putting stress on our bones, and Wolf's Law is all part of this. So what can go wrong? We talked about dwarfism from a pituitary gland issue, and that can happen, but and again, in this country, not very common. You can almost have to open up the um, Guinness Book of World Records to see true um, dwarfism. But there's other kinds of dwarf dwarfism not related to growth hormone, but instead involved with bone lengthening. And maybe you know someone with achondroplasia. 
So this is not an uncommon form of dwarfism, a chondroplastic dwarfism. And what happens is that through different reasons, they have a mutation that shuts down the lengthening of their long bones. So their torso is rather normal, right? Their torso, their irregular bones are rather normal, but their long bones, their arms and their legs are much shorter. So that's that achondroplastic dwarfism. Now, if you were to look at a true pituitary dwarfism, you would see a little person, doll-like in its or hers, uh, um, what am I trying to say, distribution of, of, or of body parts. So when you look at a chondroplastic dwarf, you recognize that their torso is pretty normal, their arms and legs are short. If you look at a true pituitary dwarf, again, not very common, look in Guinness Book of World Records, and you see these little people that are two feet tall, three feet tall, and they're perfectly proportioned like a doll. Right? That's going to be a pituitary issue. They had a growth hormone issue that involved their entire body, not related just to bones or just to cartilage. Are there organs then? Everything's teeny. Everything's just, everything's just proportionally small. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's get into what's going on with the physiology. That's kind of the anatomy of bones, and we've, that, most of that should be a, a quick review of things you've heard of before. So what's going on in your osseous tissue? Clearly, we've described that bones are very metabolically active. They're releasing hormones. They're interacting with many of your body systems. They're not acting alone. So they are maintaining their own homeostasis and influencing other systems. And number one here is calcium. So calcium homeostasis is largely maintained by your bones. And if there's a disruption to your skeletal system, it can disrupt your calcium homeostasis. And that's really going to throw some problems in with your nervous system. Now, when I say nervous system, why is calcium important? Remind me, where do we see calcium in the whole action potential chemical synapse deal? Yeah, calcium was necessary to allow for the release or the exocytosis of neurotransmitters. So if you wipe out calcium, nervous system's not working properly. And we'll see in about a week after this exam, we'll start with chapter 11, which will be muscle physiology, and we'll see how critical calcium is also to your uh, muscle physiology. So those two places are definitely going to be influenced, those two systems, by a problem with your calcium. So your bones are constantly depositing mineral deposition, making a deposit in the bank, depositing calcium, depositing phosphate, making hydroxyapatite, creating that mineral content of your bones. Osteoblasts are the cells doing that, right? They're collecting the building blocks, and they're creating this hydroxyapatite. They're also making the collagen. So those cells are making the collagen fibers, and they're building the hydroxyapatite. Got to have a lot of it. Got to have a lot of calcium and phosphate available to these cells. But what happens is that those osteoblasts cocoon themselves, don't they? They make so much of this hard osteo, this uh, hydroxyapatite that they no longer, right? They no longer have any freedom. They, they cocoon themselves inside, and now we call them osteocytes. These cells, um, well, I've mentioned this before, but let me put this into words here. Calcium and phosphates <coughs> must reach a certain level to start making crystals and we would never want them to reach that level in our other tissues. Again, you never want calcium and phosphate both in critically high concentrations because they tend to form bone, crystal-like structures. So most tissues in your body have inhibitors that they release that would prohibit them from getting ossified or becoming uh, calcified. And osteoblasts themselves neutralize those inhibitors. So what does that tell us? Osteoblasts are able to create bone, right? They're able to get the calcium and phosphate to come together to create it. And just like making, um, oh, what's it? rock candy, right? <coughs> so you get a few crystals to go, and it kind of, everything kind of starts sticking onto it. So it's the same idea. Just a few uh, granules of this will precipitate other crystals and attract more into the bone production. Now, it is possible to get ectopic ossification. What's an ectopic pregnancy? The Where the embryo is in the wrong place, in the fallopian tube, usually. So an ectopic calcification would be where there's an out-of-place bone production. You can get this in your brain, 
your lungs, your eyes, tendons, and in arteries, we call it atherosclerosis. So when there's a building up of crunchiness, right, and when, you're, when your arteries start getting hard, that hardening of your arteries is really a ossification in part of your vessels that leads to a soft organ now becoming very crunchy, right? Um, becoming ossified. So how are we, how are we, uh, how are we uh, playing yin-yang here? We've got osteoblasts constantly building bone, but we have to have another cell type, osteoclasts, which are going to dissolve and, and be in balance with these osteocytes. Now, what do the osteoclasts have? Well, they have hydrogen pumps. And those hydrogen pumps are going to allow them to get a lot of hydrogen and make hydrochloric acid. So basically, um, osteoclasts are going to be in the business of making hydrochloric acid. And what that's going to do is, is clean out and, and dissolve the bone. These um, osteoclasts, I already mentioned to you that they make hydrochloric acid, they also produce acid phosphatase. Acid phosphatase dissolves collagen. So that, what does that mean? That osteoclast can dissolve both the mineral and the non-mineral, the organic and the inorganic components. So they can wipe bone out completely. Then we had braces. Okay. So when did you go to the orthodontist? Every month, usually. Why every month? The only reason you went every month because the orthodontist wanted to eat well, right? Because once a month, he wanted to get a check. And so you went in for a movement, an adjustment of your braces. But were your bones necessarily more or less ready to move at that time? We don't know. So you put braces on. You're putting mechanical stresses. Remember I said Wolf's Law. Mechanical stresses on bones will cause them to resorb or to change. So you're putting stress on a bone. That stress is causing osteoclasts to start breaking down bone, and the bone starts to shift, the tooth starts to shift in your jaw. More stress, right? Crank it up, move it some more. They're actually working on little um, litmus tests that would measure how ready your bones are to move. So maybe rather than going every month and giving the orthodontist a check, you would dipstick every morning, and when the little thing turns blue, there's this chemical being released that tells you that, hey, your bones right now are more easy to move, and that would cause you to call the orthodontist and go in and have the adjustment done. So there's, there's, a, there's some research in that area. But again, bones don't just move because you tell them to, but we, we normally went to see the orthodontist because he just wanted to get his paycheck. Um, month by month. So again, we move those teeth and they move along. Any questions so far on anything related to bone? I've got about 12 minutes to go over a little bit of homeostasis here and we'll see how far I get. Wherever I get is where we stop and I'll make the other questions on the exam bonus. I've already made the exam. I've already copied them. I'm not going to kill any more trees. So I'll go through and say, you know, anything I don't get to in the next 12 minutes, that'll be bonus. You read through. And those questions, if you get them, would act as extra points to your kitty. So let's talk about calcium homeostasis. Again, why do we need calcium? Not just for bones, but we said we need, we need calcium for neurons, for muscles, for blood clotting, and for all exocytotic events. So anytime exocytosis occurs, there's always calcium involved. Even release of hormones sometimes releases is involving exocytosis. Phosphate. Also very important, you may remember that DNA has a phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar backbone. ATP, right? Adenosine triphosphate. So clearly phosphate, we've seen it, phospholipids, the kind of lipids found in your cell membranes. So there's no doubt that phosphate and calcium both are very, very important molecules. We better have a good control over them. And the skeleton becomes the primary storage place because, again, they can both be stored in high concentration there and released as needed. Your body needs about 1,100 grams of calcium a day. 1,100, 1,200, somewhere in that realm, 1,000 to 1,200. That's what you'll hear said. Make sure, especially ladies, especially during pregnancy, make sure 
that you're getting plenty of calcium. Do you want to take more? Is more better? No. no. More causes kidney stones. So you'll talk to people who, oh, you know, my grandma had osteoporosis, so I'm going to make sure I take extra calcium. So I'm going to take my two tablets, I'm going to make it four tablets a day, and I'm going to have three yogurts a day, a pound of cheese, and a gallon of milk. And over time, they start accumulating kidney stones because they've been overdoing the calcium. So make sure that you're not overdoing it. That minimum is right, and you don't want to be overdoing the calcium because, again, we understand now that you can have ectopic uh, uh, calculi forming. Now, that calcium is being stored mostly in the skeleton, but again, osteoclasts and osteoblasts, chewing and building bone, make it readily available for us to get the calcium we need. During pregnancy, when the skeleton is being formed in utero, mama's giving up a lot of calcium. So mama needs more calcium during pregnancy because the baby's building a, a skeleton. And if the mom's not getting adequate calcium, then she will herself rob her bones of the calcium. The baby will win. The baby's skeleton will win. And the mother's skeleton will lose calcium during pregnancy. So again, during pregnancy, very important to supplement. If you're looking at your blood levels, just remember 10. Um, I'm not going to get really crazy about this, but your normal calcium levels in your blood should be around 10. Just remember that number. And um, calcium can diffuse pretty easily, so we can, we can move it around the body pretty well. So what would happen if you have hypocalcemia, low levels of calcium in the blood? First of all, what could cause it? If you have low levels of calcium, maybe you're vitamin D deficient because... Vitamin D is important for your calcium absorption. So maybe you live in Michigan, or maybe you live in a place where there isn't much sunshine. So you're vitamin D deficient, and as a result, you're not absorbing calcium very well. Maybe you've got diarrhea, right? With diarrhea, you're losing a lot of calcium. Maybe you have a thyroid tumor. Let's think about this. Thyroid tumors. The thyroid gland also makes a hormone called calcitonin. Calcitonin is released when calcium levels are too high. So, and what would it happen? If calcium levels are too high, then the body's going to create mechanisms to lower it back down. So if you're overproducing calcitonin, it's going to drive down your calcium. Okay? So if you're overproducing thyroid to, uh, hormones, and one of them is calcitonin, you'll drive your calcium levels down. Or maybe you have an underactive parathyroid. What does parathyroid make? Parathyroid, parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone is produced when calcium levels are too low and would normally drive your calcium levels back to normal. But if you don't have parathyroid, then you wouldn't have any way of pushing them back up so they would stay low. So you would maintain hypocalcemia. Or maybe that baby is robbing you of all of your calcium, making it skeleton, you're pregnant, or you're lactating. Or maybe there is a surgical remover, removal of some either the parathyroid or the thyroid gland. Okay? So that would lead to hypocalcemia. We've got problems, right, if we don't have enough calcium. We've already talked about nervous system, muscles, muscles blood clotting all being affected. So our calcium levels in our body are going to be a constant balance between our dietary intake, our urinary and fecal losses, and any exchange in our bones, any osseous uh, communication back and forth. So there are three hormones that are going to regulate your calcium homeostasis. I've already mentioned two of them in passing, so I'm going to come back and talk about them again if you didn't get that. I just mentioned parathyroid was important, calcitonin was important, and another one, calcitriol. So these are the three hormones that are going to regulate your calcium. Let's start off. Calcitriol. This molecule, well, first of all, what I, I'm not going to get into all the steps here. I just want you to see the big picture of this. This is your skin. And this is your skin basically receiving UV radiation. And with UV radiation, you create vitamin D. Now, there's a lot of steps to it. And that's really all I want you to know right now. But through your skin and through this hormone, calcitriol, you make more calcium.
Okay, so with increased vitamin D and this hormone along the way called calcitriol, you are able to make more calcium, okay? Increase calcium. Calcitriol is sitting down here. It's made by your liver. We won't get too excited about it. Just recognize that it is a hormone and it's necessary in the making of vitamin D, which is critical to your uh, uptake of calcium. Okay, so we'll see that the liver and the kidney are critical in making this calcitriol, but it, it doesn't matter if you don't get enough UV from your, in your skin, right? you can't make it. The second thing, um, what does, calci what does uh, calcitriol do? So calcitriol, therefore, behaves as a hormone and raises your calcium. Just have that connection, right? More UV, more vitamin D, more calcitriol, more calcium. This is going to be important for you to have normal bone health. If you don't have enough calcium or you don't have enough vitamin D, you could lead to the extreme case with rickets. I mentioned rickets as a disease where you don't have enough calcium and your bones are, therefore, soft. That's in kids, you get rickets. In adults, if you didn't have enough vitamin D, you would have osteomalacia. What is malacia? So softening, right? So your bones are getting soft, right? Osteomalacia. It's different than osteoporosis, but still not good, right? You don't want your bones to be soft. You want nice, nice hard bones. Second uh, story here is the calcitonin and the PTH. Also very, very important in your overall metabolism. What you'll see here is this image uh, from your textbook kind of pulls all these together, it talks about your uptake of calcium and how it's going to regulate your blood levels um, and how both PTH and calcitriol and calcitonin are important. This is an overall slide, but let's talk about each of these. Calcitonin, hormone, made by the thyroid gland specifically by cells called the C cells. Why are they C cells? Because they make calcitonin. They're also called the clear cells, just to confuse us. Why does your body make calcitonin? It makes calcitonin because your body sees that your cal calcium levels are too high. Okay? So your calcium levels are too high, so your thyroid starts releasing calcitonin. Well, how would, your how would you get rid of calcium? Tell me, how would you choose to shut down? You've already got too much calcium. How are you going to lower it? Okay, forget diet, but what is, what is your body? What is your homeostasis? What is your metabolism going to do to fix it? It's going to inhibit your osteoclasts. Because what are osteoclasts doing? Chewing, right? They're releasing calcium. I don't want more calcium. I don't want to release calcium. So I'm going to inhibit the chewing cells, the osteoclasts, and I'm going to stimulate my osteoblasts, telling them to get busy and build more bone since I've got extra calcium in the neighborhood. Right? So it just tells, hey, osteoblasts get busy, osteoclasts take a break. Makes sense? As a result, your calcium levels return back to normal. Okay, very important that all this works well. Then finally, we have parathyroid hormone. We have already said that it's made by the parathyroid gland, not a difficult thing. The parathyroid gland is released when your blood calcium levels are low. It works largely in antagonistic fashion against calcitonin. It is going to raise your blood calcium, right? It's too low, we need to raise it. What are ways you would do it? Well, one is it actually turns on the osteo clasts. Now, I know it says it binds to receptor here, and that's true, but look what it says. It says it raises osteoclasts. So what does that do? I've got low calcium. I want to increase it, so I want my osteoclast to start chewing, right? Releasing more calcium into the blood. Number two, I'm going to tell the kidneys, you know what? I need some calcium. Please resorb more. Put less calcium in the urine. I'm going to go to the kidneys and say, you know what? We need more of that calcitriol stuff. We need to get more calcium through that other mechanism. And finally, I'm going to inhibit 
osteoblasts, right? I, I don't need to be building bone right now. I need to be conserving it. I need to increase my calcium levels. Okay. So those two hormones are shown in this picture as far as their overall metabolism or homeostasis. So if you have, let's start here. If you have hypercalcemia, you have excessive calcium levels. Yeah, so if you have excessive calcium levels, right? I just, I just disconnected, so I may be... Maybe recording, I'm recording my voice right now, but the slides are not going to be moving for a second. So I've got increased calcium. So the blood levels are increased. What's going to be released? When blood calcium is in excess, what hormone's released? Calcitonin. Calcitonin is made by the thyroid. And it will do what? It will cause the calcitonin to be released. And what does it do? It's going to go down and reduce the osteoclasts and increase the osteoblasts. As a result, I normalize everything back to normal. Calcium levels return to normal. I no longer am going to be releasing calcitonin. If I overdid it, I might start releasing what? If I overdid it and went too low, I might start releasing parathyroid hormone, right? So again, we've got this constant yin-yang, this constant balancing act going on. Look at this slide as well, and it just tells you in a moment of hypocalcemia, low blood calcium, what am I going to make now? Parathyroid hormone. It did not work by four me two mechanisms, but it said it worked by four mechanisms, and I see all four mechanisms listed here. Again, all of them are going to return my levels back to normal and, again, shut down the necessity of, re of fixing this and reduce the parathyroid. That was calcium. Phosphate isn't as complicated. There aren't a lot of hormones involved with phosphate regulation. Um, we need phosphate in our bones. Again, normal levels, about 3.5 to 4. It was 10 for calcium, wasn't it? And there's two basic forms of phosphate. They're floating around in our blood um, as ions. Don't worry about the specific names of those. And uh, the regulation of phosphate is nowhere near as tight it's not as important. It can get a little bit out of control. Uh, no immediate functional disorder. So if your phosphate levels are off, there's not like a major problem that you're going to have. And uh, basically, your uh, parathyroid hormone can lower your phosphate levels by increasing some uh, urinary excretion. But again, not a lot of control over phosphate. So just know that calcium is highly regulated. Phosphate is not. Overall, over 20 different hormones affecting your bones, uh, affecting the vitamins that affect your bones. And clearly, we know we have more uh, rapid development during um, childhood up through puberty and adolescence. There are surges of hormones, <laughs> testosterone and estrogen. What do we know about testosterone? What does testosterone do to bone lengthening? What happens to boys at puberty? They usually shoot up, right? So we know that testosterone causes bones to elongate. It actually increases the activity of the osteoblasts and the growth plate. But estrogens, the hormones released at female uh, puberty, are going to start actually to slow down the growth. And so it actually causes the epiphyseal plate to close. And women reach their adult height, usually within 18 months of menses. So typically, once periods start, then about 18 months later, you can look in the mirror and that's how tall you're going to be for the rest of your life. Maybe two years, but there are very few exceptions to that. Typically, once puberty begins, you have reached adult height within the next couple of years. Okay, um, and I've already mentioned anabolic steroids, or didn't mention them, but uh, uh, anabolic steroids can cause growth to stop, so you would never, never want to see a young person think that taking anabolic steroids is a good thing to build their muscle because it actually shortened them up. So anabolic steroids can actually inhibit uh, lengthening of the bones. 
So clearly you would not want to play that game. And there are kids who are on steroids as kids, and it will stunt their growth, some of them, um, medically, if they're on steroids for other reasons. Now I'm going to stop there. And everything on a little bit of fractures, there's not much here, but a little bit on fractures and osteoporosis, not many. Just read through those last eight or so slides. I'll include a couple of those questions on the exam. I'll make them bonus, or I'll include them in the curve that likely will be on this exam, OK? Now, I want you to go and have a great couple of days. I want you to focus on this. I want you the very, very best you can. I'll see you all on Thursday in the blue and gold room. And oh, I have tremendous hope. I just, look, I almost always, not always, but almost always will curve exams. Not because you guys don't do well, but I expect a lot out of you. And so with that comes a little bit of a gift called a curve. It's not, it's not a slam.